Thank you, folks. We're just waiting for the thumbs up from our live streamer. Just give me your also, yeah. As soon as I get the thumbs up, we're going. situations. We're trained to suppress reactions like fight, flight, and freeze. We develop, and this is the critical issue here, we develop a belief that a strong mind is the same as a strong body. And for the most part in your career, you've probably found that, that as you strengthen your mental strength and your psych what a uh, beautiful term called psychological capital, as you increase your psychological capital, 
you're also, of course, being fit. So it makes sense that one would think that a strong mind is the same as a strong body. But when things get tough, and we fall back on this internal training, the difficulty is that we start to use the mind to control the body. Because in our view, the mind has never, ever failed us. It's never let us down. It's always allowed us to talk our way through whatever situation we have to deal with. When I interview recruits, both for the military and, uh, and for, uh, and for uh, the police services, um, the first thing when I ask is, well, how do you deal with it? They'll describe a stressful situation. They'll describe a stressful awareness. And I'll say, well, what keeps you from having this go south? What keeps you from having this escalate? And they say, typically, what they'll say, I talk myself out of it. I just tell myself to stay calm. Well, I don't know about you, but the last time you had someone who was terribly uncalm in front of you, did you find that screaming, stay calm, helped? <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm just drawing from a, from a scenario in a hospital room when, when my, my partner was like, in the ICU and there was a lot of screaming going on in the room next door, and the physician was shrieking at the top of his lungs, stay calm, damn it, stay calm. And, you know, that went on for a couple of hours. I'm not sure who won in that. So, you know, I want to talk to you today about something very, very different and doesn't seem very often in, in these talks, is that the body-mind connection is not the mind controlling the body. In fact, it's the reverse. And it's the reverse because that's just how we're built. Um, while some of you were talking, and since I'm a, I'm a social media addict, um, I was on Twitter and I noticed that there was a little thing that went by uh, in the leadership summit that said, each day we process 34 gigabytes of information. 34 gigabytes. It would crash any laptop. It would crash any system. So when you think about the amount of information that's coming in, your mind can't keep up with it. But your body responds anyway. Now the area I want to s focus in on, these are some of the risk factors of PTSD, and some of them are not significant. What we know is that prior psych problems and psychopathology in the family of origin don't correlate with a risk factor, or don't form a risk factor for PTSD. The other ones are fairly small, but they're small to medium. But the one I want to focus in on is the peri what we call peritraumatic emotional response, which is the panic, the hyperarousal, the difficulty in resetting, the difficulty in coming back down uh, from, from an intense situation. Okay, and that's where I'm going to be zoning in. Peritraumatic dissociation is a little, it has a higher risk factor probability, but um, that's a fairly, fairly specific area that needs a little bit more specialized discussion, which we won't have time for. So let's talk about the physiology. What happens in your body I'm tracking here as well as the cut notes. What happens in your body um, that explains trauma at a very gut level? Okay, and that gut level is just really important. So the two back black lines that you're seeing are what we call the window of tolerance. We all have a window of tolerance. My window of tolerance some days is about an inch thick, right, or an inch wide. Some days it may be moved about six inches. My partner, however, has a window of tolerance that's maybe about three or five feet. Right? Um, but it's good to know that. Because then I know when I'm getting to the soft edge of my window of tolerance, it tells me when I'm at the hard edge. When I'm at the hard edge, just feed me chocolate and I'm okay. Right? <laughs> Actually, I'm also good at getting chocolate on my soft edge, too. But don't tell me to stay calm. So the window of tolerance is affected by a whole lot of things, or, or, or our physiology is affected by a whole lot of things. Cumulative incidences. This is something that everyone understands. So this is something that's very rarely covered well because we think of PTSD as occurring when there's one index incident. And that's just not how it works, and you've heard that before. It's a set of cumulative incidences. And it can be, often people will come in and say, I don't get it, I've been a police officer, I've been a military member for 25, 30 years, I break my ankle, and everything falls apart. I can't go back to work. Notice the involvement of the body in this, right? We can shut all kinds of things on emotionally, but when the body gives way, Everything goes south. Cumulative incidences can be, a, in a day, how many incidences do you go to that will set your physiology going? In and of themselves, they may not seem traumatic, but if we aren't resetting and back into this window of tolerance, they become a problem. Yes, and you can also have a, an index trauma. 
But usually with the index trauma, as you heard before, we kind of walk away from that index trauma and say, well, you know, it's really that bad. You know, you know, I've dealt with worse. It always seems like it wasn't that bad when you're walking away from it. But you have to add in cumulative incidences. When that happens, we pop out of this window of resilience. Now that's okay, most of us do. We pop out, we pop back in. We pop out, we pop back in. And I wake up in the morning, my breakfast is cold, I pop a little bit out of my window of resilience. <coughs> my partner warms up my breakfast, I'm okay, I pop back in. You know, a little bit of road rage, I pop out, pop back in. You don't want to be on the road when I'm driving, by the way. I should say that in a room for the police officers. <laughs> Um, so we do, I mean it's normal, you pop out, you pop back in, but that's the reset through the day, it's perfectly normal, it's okay. The difficulty with PTSD or anything intense, emotionally intense, is that we pop out and we stay out. We stay stuck up in this region, okay? And here's the other side of it. Okay, so this is what we call hyperarousal. I don't know if I got that, yep, there we go, we got hyperarousal. You heard about some of the things before in, um, Dr. Wu and, and Dr. Lee's presentation. Okay. It goes the other way too. We can <coughs> pop it down and numb out. We can go into hyperarousal. Hyperarousal has happened at the end of the day mostly. You come home, you know, you chill with Netflix, but you're really not chilling. You're so new. Um, alcohol, drugs, all of that. This is all that happens down that, that enables hyperarousal and keeps that stuckness. Now here's something that you don't see a lot about in, in terms of uh, the literature. You can have responses that are incongruent with the situation. How often have you seen somebody who, when you know the fire alarm is going, they're still munching on their snacks? Mm -hmm. Or how often have you seen someone who, in the photocopy doesn't work, totally loses it? Okay. Well, okay, that's not a good example, but you know what I mean. So this incongruence is also a mark of dysregulation. And by the way, if you are losing it on the photocopier, please talk to somebody. Um, because that could be a pointer to other issues, okay? Um, so one of the things that happens here is that we can use our breathing to reset into the window of resilience. How many people know about the four square breathing? Oh dear. Oh, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so there's tactical breathing, there's a four square breathing, four in, hold for four, eight out, or four out for four. Um, there's the tactical breathing. And so all of these, you can use all kinds of breathing uh, exercises to reset into this window. But honestly, if you're stuck, you're stuck. The brain is set up so that once you're in this region, all you, you have, what we have to learn how to do is to wait till it's over. But we're not good at that. So we go into all of these strategies here and the hyperarousal strategies to try and force this to come back in. Okay. Now, as with athletics, what's the mark of a good fit person? After you run a marathon, the reset of your heart rate. Right? Running a marathon and, and you know getting injured at the finish line is not a mark of good health, right? Whether that injury is psychological or physical. So the rate of recovery is, is a mark of your well-being. How well we reset back into this window of resilience is the mark of our recovery. Now what happens at work? Oh, I said I wasn't gonna have a slide at work, but I guess I put one in. Um, in the stuck state, and think about your work situation, in the stuck state,